Welcome everybody to the Health Pro Guest Show with myself, Coach Taylor, and today's guest is Nathan Rourke. Nathan has played for the BC Lions and is now making his jump to the NFL. We're very excited for him going to the Jaguars. Um, Nathan, thanks so much for jumping on, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Taylor. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries, man. Um, Nathan, so as you know, like the Health Pro Guest Show is basically about you and how you got to what you're doing now. So I mm -hmm. think it would be extremely valuable for the next generation of football players coming up to understand not just like the fun, cool part about like going from high school to university and university to pros, but I'm sure there's a lot of steps in between that and things that you didn't anticipate getting to that next level um, where you had to not just physically, but mentally and emotionally level up to make sure that you could stay on pace with what the expectations were. So I think with that being said, understanding more about your journey is going to help the next generation do their thing and hopefully give them that edge getting into that next level too. So um, Nathan, can you start off by telling us just like what got you into football in the first place and then walk us through your journey to where you are now? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, for me, uh, growing up in Canada, as you know, football is not the, the most, uh, uh, popular sport by any means. I think it definitely, uh, definitely hockey was one big one growing up. I grew up in uh, the Oakville, Ontario area, the GTA, mm -hmm. the Greater Toronto area. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember getting into football because I was a huge Brett Favre fan. I, I didn't, I watched uh, a 1996 Green Bay Packers highlight, uh, a video when they won the Super Bowl in 96. Um, I watched that, uh, on repeat when I was a, as a kid instead of cartoons. And, um, and so I, as soon as I was able to get into, into, uh, into contact football, I played flag for a bit when I was about five. And when I was seven, I got into organized tackle football and, um, really been playing it ever since. So, um, that is, it was like when I was that age, when I was about four or five years old, that's when I was like, I want to be in the NFL. Like, this is my goal and this is my dream. And, and to be honest with you, Taylor, it's been a, it's been a heck of a journey to, to get to this point. Um, I took a, a very convoluted route, um, yeah. I, I, as I said, I, I grew up in Oakville, Ontario, went to started high school at uh, Holy Trinity Catholic Secondary in Oakville, um, did uh, did all three, I did three years there up until my grade 11 year. And after that, um, I was really trying to do everything I could to get a division one offer thinking again, I wanted to play in the NFL. Division one route is probably the easiest way of doing that. Mm. And uh, was really wasn't getting recruited in the way that I thought or I should be, or at least I expected to be, even though I was going down to doing all the college camps. Um, I was trying to get in front of college coaches. They just weren't coming up to see me. So um, there was an opportunity that came up for me to go and play uh, a year in Alabama. So um, and just outside of Montgomery, a small town of Elmore, Alabama, Edgewood Academy. Um, they contacted me, said you could come in play for a year. Their their guy had just their starter had just left. The next guy up was a, was a young guy who's going to be a freshman. So there was like kind of a good little uh, win win situation for both sides. Um, so I ended up going down there, had a great year, had a lot of fun, learned the American game. That was my first year playing the American game, um, but I didn't really I didn't get an offer. It was I was too late in the process. Mm. Um, didn't end up getting an offer uh, I did from a division one school. So I went the ju junior college route. Um, I looked at a couple of different JUCOs and uh, I remember visiting Fort Scott, uh, Kansas, mm. uh, which for Fort Scott Community College, uh, which is about an hour south of Kansas City, Missouri, and yeah. about 30 minutes from the Missouri border. And I remember when I was there, they were like, the coaches uh, said to me, they said, there's nothing here but football and school. And they were right about that. They had like a subway, a Walmart, and that was about it. It was very, very small, uh, not a lot of great facilities, all that different kind of stuff. Right. Um, but I, I took that chance because that's all I really wanted. Um, I was an academic qualifier. So after having a, a pretty good season there at Fort Scott, I was able to transfer uh, immediately to immediately to a four year school. Um, mm -hmm. After that season, I had two offers um, from uh, Division One schools. One of them being Ohio University, uh, which is where I uh, enrolled in January of 2017. Mm -hmm. And then I did three, and I said I did three seasons there. Um, and then from there, didn't get a chance in the NFL. Got an opportunity to play for the BC Lions last year. They gave me a chance to be the starter after uh, the great Mike Riley had a had a uh, called it a, a career. Mm -hmm. He was able to come in, fit in with a really great team, a great organization. Um, and after this past season, I was able to get a chance to get to the NFL. So 
convoluted route to eventually get to the goal and hopefully it's just starting so long-winded answer to that but my journey's been all over the place so that's awesome man no and i think that you know relatively to the story itself you probably shortened a lot of that down for us yeah a few minutes so that's good yeah i appreciate that um so i think the something to highlight there too is just like that juco route because a lot of guys Mm -hmm. either one like haven't heard of it for myself like up until my last year of high school i didn't even think i didn't even know that it existed because right i was thinking i was going div one too honestly Mm -hmm. (laughs) as Mm -hmm. most guys probably do um but, and then the guys who do understand like what junior college is, or their only idea of it is a lot of times like uh, last chance university where you're just mm-hmm. seeing like these dropouts, these guys who didn't make it. And they're just kind of like the have beens type guys, but mm-hmm. that's not necessarily the case. And what was that experience like for you there? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. There was a lot of different reasons why people ended up at GCO. Um, sometimes they were like you see on last chance you, there was people who were, you know, got in trouble um, academically at a four-year school. Um, a lot of div- like big power five school mm-hmm. uh, bounce backs is what we called them. They had gone originally out of high school to a big school. Um, and then they had for one reason or another flunked out or they got in trouble sometimes with the law. Sometimes it was a personal issue, um, but they were no longer eligible to be um, at that school or they just wanted a better opportunity. Um, This was before the transfer portal kind of took over college football. Mm -hmm. Um, So we had a lot of great talent, um, but some interesting characters, people that were dealing with some stuff. And then there was people like myself who were just under recruited. And there was a great amount of people there, too, who had just kind of bet on themselves. Um, And the thing with junior college is that they bring in a lot of bodies. There was a hundred, I mean, it's, it's only a two year um, track and you're only there two years. And um, they bring, they brought in 120 people. I remember the first day and to try to, um, you know, get rid of some people, they, they really pushed us in about a month or two weeks to a month period. They were trying to make people quit and kind of um, get people to, kind of size down the group a little bit and kind of look at who was really there. I always tell people about junior college is that you really find out if you love football or not, because there's none of that extracurricular stuff, the the crowds, the, uh, the nightlife, the, you know, the, the fame, the accolades, the nice uh, weight room or any of the nice facilities. There's none of that. It's just football and school and the people that are willing to prioritize those two things at an equal amount of time, because if you don't take care of your academics, then you're not going to, you're not going to be eligible to transfer anyways. Mm. Um, If you prioritize those two things, you're going to be able to get out. Um, And it's also an interesting dynamic because um, how do you make a team when people are just trying to look out for themselves? Right. Mm. And so, and I was no exception to that. I was, you know, after games, I'd put together a highlight tape, no matter if we won or lost, just because I was trying to get that exposure. Um, But that's just the part of it. And um, so Again, if you are able to take care of those type of things, the, the school and the academics and and really prove to not only yourself, but other people that you're about football, then um, I think those are the, the people that are able to have success. And uh, fortunately, I was one of those people. Cool. Good. Thanks for sharing, man. So you have 120 guys come in on day one and within 30, mm-hmm. 60 days, the coaches are trying to just weed through you know, mm-hmm. they're trying to get the cream to cry to, to, to rise to the top. Right. And mm-hmm. how do they go about doing that? Are they like, what, what kind of things did you have to, did you have to get to do to, to prove yourself? Well, I think, uh, physical challenges was definitely one of them. They ran us like crazy. And yeah. I remember the, the weight room sessions just being absolutely ludicrous, but the, 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 you know, the stuff that I know about strength conditioning now, there was no reason we were doing the things that we were doing. Um, they were just really trying to get you to quit. And, yeah. um, for some people, and then they were kind of nasty to you. <laughs> they, the coaches were not saying nice things. And I remember my roommate was a highly touted guy. He had gotten some big 10 offers. Um, I didn't qualify academically. So he was at a junior college, uh, like many of the guys were, and he just didn't like the way that the head coach who was also the O-line coach was talking to him Mm -hmm. and it didn't pan out for him. And he was, he was gone after the first day and that was on his own accord. So, um, they were doing a lot of different things to make sure that you were mentally tough enough, but also physically, um, just to, to be able to get through, uh, the, the first weeding out process. Okay, cool. And what do you think you need to do as an athlete to, stand out in a, in a group that big, like, of course you have to be able to meet those physical challenges, but like, Mm -hmm. do you, do you need to be the guy who's like at the front of the class all the time? Do you need to be the guy who's always like hands up or the the one who's always responding to coaches, rhetorical questions in the group, like things like that? Or do they want you to be more of that? Just like, 
quiet soldier, get it done type person. What did you find? I think there's definitely a, a time on the field to be the quiet soldier and kind of, you know, there's going to be some things that they're going to ask of you that are kind of crazy. And it, that, that extends to the college division one level as well, in my experience. And mm-hmm. sometimes we have to put your head down and, and not be a complainer. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of the academics, absolutely. You want to prioritize that when you're in junior college, you want to be sitting at the front of the class. You want to be talking to the professor after, um, after class and, and uh, you know, arranging for, one-on-one time if you're struggling and, you know, meeting with your tutors and not messing around during study hall and um, all those different type of things. Those are, that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, and I've seen a lot of really, really good athletes at that level um, mess around too much and, you know, focus too much on girls and stuff like that and not get their, not get out, even though that they're, you know, they were better than some of the guys that were, you know, at my four-year school. Right. So um, I, I think that, on the field, especially, I think they're looking for people who are, you know, when it came to those, that physical conditioning, the, the workouts and, um, all that different type of stuff, they're not looking for complainers. They're people that are going, okay, this is what it is. This is what, uh, the cards that we've been dealt, they suck, but what I'm not going to do is that I'm not going to let this affect my attitude. I'm not going to affect the way that this, uh, this, I'm not going to let this affect the way I carry myself and how it, um, how I, how I interact with other people. Like those are all things that you're tested with. And so when, uh, I remember after I got done junior college and I ended up going to Ohio, I, there was nothing really that was as challenging. And so I was able to kind of be an optimistic and positive guy around times when people are tired and they're, you know, they're, they're cursing at everything and they just want to get it over with. You can be that, that leader and be like, Hey, we're good. We got five more. Come on, let's go like that kind of attitude because a you've dealt with that before, but also you've done much worse. So. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And can you walk us through what a day in the life was like for you? It's like in season, um, maybe mm-hmm. at the div one level, what did that look like time you get up and times breakfast, all the events and meetings you got to do, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in when we're, we were in season at um, at Ohio, um, you would be we would in the morning would be classes. So mm-hmm. it would depend on what um, uh, what, what your schedule was like. Um, it really depended if and, you know you had more classes and less flexibility the the first couple of years that you were there. Um, but during the season, we would have a lift. Um, I was usually in the seven o'clock class, uh, seven o'clock group, um, but just because I was a, I was a morning person, and so I'd get up. Um, around 6 15 6 30 uh, have a little breakfast be I'd, I'd I'd say I'd probably were tried to be there half an hour early just because I'd like to do my own rehab or rehab stuff and foam roll and all that soft tissue stuff um, and then we're got, we got the the lift would be about an hour and then I'd head to class um, uh, until about 2 10 and then that's when meeting started um, meeting uh, practice would we would get out of practice around 5 36 um and then you'd have your homework um uh, that you'd be working on or your study your extra film all that different type of stuff and then mm-hmm. and then you'd repeat after that <laughs> rinse and repeat daily hey eh? there you go yeah gotcha and then what about like what's a game day like what's the whole mm-hmm. preparation feel like uh for a home game i imagine for away games you got to take a flight somewhere else and stuff but yeah what's a home game like yeah home games um they, so we usually played at, in the afternoon on Saturdays. There was a time in uh, in the MAC with the Mid American Conference where Ohio was playing in that they play midweek games. They call it MACTION, and we played on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, some crazy mm-hmm. times. Um, but if they're in on a Saturday, uh, they'd be usually around one or four o'clock, um, and so you would be staying in a hotel um, just off the campus. Just team would stay together overnight. Oh, okay we'd go to, um, to breakfast together. Um, if it was a later game, we'd also have lunch, um, and we'd have that pregame meal. Uh, we'd walk over together, um, off the bus, and then we'd have a pregame meeting where we'd kind of have our team meeting as well as our position meeting, kind of go over the last couple of things we need to think about before we get into a game. Um, and we, we, uh, we hit the field and then we'd have, a you know, three, I would say three, two and a half hours, uh, before we start our formal teamwork uh, warmups and like so you get on the field as I'd get on the field as quickly as I, I could and just try to take it all in and be present and all that type of stuff and get your work warm up in and feel really good about things and then get a good sweat and then you go out as a team and play the game games 
uh, the in between the, the CFL, the NFL, and college football. The college football games are the longest. They're they're okay. really really long. They have the most breaks, and it's pretty ridiculous, honestly. But um, long games, and then um, and uh, yeah, you play the game. So I mean, the biggest thing is that I mean you're you're doing everything as a team, and and the, you know all the meals are together. You're meeting and stuff like that. When I got to the pros, it was a little bit of a different adjustment, but no, that's not wasn't what you were asking but i mean that that was what game plan the game yeah. uh, day was like okay cool yeah so it's very structured the team actually i didn't know that the team will get into a hotel room off campus but close did, by yeah. campus, even just for like home games just get everybody together and mm-hmm. focus on just t- coaches are probably just trying to isolate players and be like this is here there's no distractions there's no opportunity exactly. to break something tonight right it's a friday night mm-hmm. they don't want anyone doing anything stupid so okay exactly exactly i, I think uh college coaches are probably the and football coaches i think in general you can attest to this they're they're probably the most paranoid people in the in the world right they're they just don't want things to go wrong they want control over everything and ohio is, uh, does have a little bit of a rev- uh, reputation for being a party school so people they didn't want especially the people that weren't playing to uh to be a distraction or anything um so yeah we did stay off campus um and i think i think it was a good thing i think it was yeah. it was we we i think until we had like a walk we had a walk through or another practice on the friday um and we would be that would end around four or five and then we would just be together until the right up until the game so we would stay we do we'd watch a movie the night before we'd have our team dinner and then we would be to just be together. And, and that was a good distraction from yeah. um, just the rest of the week. Right. So I, yeah. I always thought that that um, was a good thing. I always appreciated that. Gotcha. Makes sense. So we can probably all appreciate that. Like during the season, lots and lots of structure, your day is almost probably, probably planned out every almost 24 hours of your day is like completely structured around school, football, rest, mm-hmm. recover, train. Um, what about off season? What kind of structure, mm-hmm. if at any, there is and how much contact do you have with the team, the coaches, um, the, you know, the trainers that is not that, that that's like kind of that you're committed to that you have a dedicated time to, or is there any? Yeah, it's, it's still pretty structured in the off season. Um, it, during there's really, there's really three or I would say four different kind of seasons, uh, for us, there was obviously in season, which was the fall and, and a little bit of the winter. Um, but in the, in the winter, in the new year, after the season, um, we would have our winter workouts, which would be, you'd be, uh, it'd be every five days a week, every morning. So you'd be, um, we'd have all our classes in the afternoon or the evening, um, in the spring semester. So we would be doing morning, we'd be on the field running and doing, uh, weights, uh, mm. I think weights four times, um, and maybe it was four, four or five times on the field doing speed, agility, acceleration, deceleration, conditioning, yeah. all that different type of stuff. We do that all in the morning and we'd be done by around 10. Um, uh, and then, and then we'd have spring ball, which would happen in around March, April, which mm-hmm. is where you're allowed 15 padded or not padded practices, but 15 practices. Um, and then a spring game. Um, so that kind of, kind of go back into season mode, but just everything's in the morning rather than the afternoon. Right. Um, so that's very hands-on, very, um, you're still meeting. And even in the winter before spring ball, you're kind of, the coaches are still allowed to do certain things and you're able to meet and talk ball leading up to spring ball. Mm. Um, and then after that's done in the summer, uh, most teams are required to stay during the summer. We were able to take a class, um, and then continue lifting in the, in the summer. So there'd be, you'd have, um, you know, five days a week, you'd have, uh, uh, you know, lift and a run. Um, again, you're on the field doing, you know, agility or speed work, and then you'd be in the weight room four days a week, um, have the weekends off. It was pretty chill in the summer, but you'd still have organized stuff. And then you'd have team or stuff without the coaches, a player ran seven on seven or Skelly, whatever you'd like to call it, um, position drills and stuff um, on your own time, the coaches, I think things have changed, but I think at the time when I went, their coaches weren't allowed to be a part of it. Um, so still very much thinking about that. Um, you take, be taking like one class or two classes potentially, yeah. um, during that time. So you can be, they can require you to be there and just kind of keeps you around and then you're in fall camp. Right. So then that's kind of how the year went. So year round, we would get, I would say four or three weeks. Our biggest break would be after the season 
going into the spring semester, that'd be our biggest break. Okay. Um, but other than that, we would get three weeks, one week at a time off. And then every time, everything else, we would be at the, at the, uh, at the uh, school, at the facilities, you know, doing what we need to do. And it's kind of a year round thing. So, yeah. Okay. So, so it's three weeks off basically is the, you're doing, you've got 49, 49 weeks dedicated to football year round. Mm-hmm. You've got three weeks of what, is, what about Christmas? Maybe I missed that part, but around the holidays and stuff to you get like yeah. five days off or something like that. We would, we would. The unfortunate part, and it was kind of, we were able to see it this year. My, my brother is still on the team at Ohio and, cool. um, and he, their bowl game this year was on the 31st of December. So they had their season, it finished up in November, late November. And then they had um, some time off where they were, where they had the, their final exams and stuff, um, which I think was the first or second week of December. Then they had a couple of weeks off where he came back home and then they went back out and finished the season, started their bowl practices. And then they came back and they were done. Semester didn't start until January 15th or something. Yeah. Um, so they had that time off. So that's probably their biggest break, but then he'll get the, and then he'll get uh, three weeks, one after the end of the spring semester. And then uh, one week uh, at the end of the summer semester, and then one week before fall camp. And then, so it'd be, yeah, Christmas holidays, but again, it, it depends on how well you do if you're in the MAC championship or what your bowl game is like, and you yeah. really don't have any idea about what that could be. So um, I had it both ways. I had my, in, in my senior year, we had, um, we had our bowl game on January 3rd. Yep. Um, and I had in 17, our, our bowl game, I think was the 20th of December. Yeah. So you, it depends on really how, how your, how your season goes. I hear you. Okay. Thanks. If we were to take you back to high school or just graduating mm-hmm. high school, and now you're, you're prospecting yourself out there and trying to get to Div 1 school and doing whatever you can to get picked up in, in different areas, mm-hmm. like what types of things did you, did you have to do after high school? Or when did that process start for you for like, okay, I need to start doing A, B, C, D to hopefully try to get myself there. Like what were those steps that you had to take? Um, I think the first thing was you had to make sure that you were academically eligible. Okay. Um, so as a Canadian, right, um, to get into American school, you have to get do standardized testing. So mm-hmm. either an SAT or an ACT. So we, I had to make sure that I was going to study to do that. Um, ended up taking the ACT when I was in Alabama. Um, uh, and then you just have to make sure you have the right credit, the right amount of credits that's going to transfer over. So that's the number one is getting your academics in order. The second thing is um, making sure that you're making contact with those college college coaches and shaking their hands and being on campus and letting them see you live. Um, Oftentimes your, your, your high school coach, my high school coach helped um, with sending film out and making sure Mm -hmm. that coaches were knowing that I was going to be there. And they kind of looked at my, my my film when I went to, went to camps. Yeah. Um, That was, that was a big thing too. Um, but, um, like I said earlier, like for me, I did all those things and it still didn't work. Right. So I, I still had to do additional steps to be, to, to be able to, uh, to get on the radar, um, because I was not, I've never been a guy who jumps out physically, um, pretty average looking guy. And, um, and so I had to, I had to prove people otherwise that I I belonged at, at that, that, at that level. So, um, but if, for you know, the people who are watching, who are trying to go to division one, um, I think BC is a great place to to play Canadian football because they do play American rules. Yes. Um, I think that's a, a big advantage. Um, but if you, if you really, really want to do it, I would really recommend playing in the States. Um, because, um, I think that just being in that atmosphere and being in that environment is going to warrant a lot of opportunities and, uh, just greater the chance of people coming to come and see you um i know that there's stories all the time of people like chapel hubbard or who are who are being able to be recruited right from uh a high school in canada um but i was no chuba hubbard coming out of high school yeah. and there's not many of them right so yeah. um I, I i think that would be that would be my advice on top of the things that i already mentioned with the school and yeah. getting the college coaches contacts and all that stuff i hear you so let's fast forward then outside of you, you finished up university. We tried mm-hmm. to go NFL and it didn't, it didn't work that way right out of the gates, but what was that transition mm-hmm. like from going from Ohio to the BC Lions? Like who'd you have to contact? Mm-hmm. Was there some type of camps that you went to and how'd that whole process work? 
Yeah, so I got really lucky with that, um, being a Canadian and having some success at Ohio, playing there for three years. I was actually able to be drafted. Um, I was drafted in 2020 um, by the Lions, and um, as a Canadian, again, I was eligible for the draft, and so the uh, the Lions uh, picked me up in in the second round, and um, and so I was there, you know, for sure. And then in 2020, that was the COVID year, so we didn't end up having a season there, but I was still able to meet with the coaches of uh, the offensive coordinator there, uh, Jordan Maximic, uh, in preparation for a potential. We were thinking about doing a bubble at one point. We were a bunch of different possibilities, a short and seasoned. <laughs> um, and, but we kept on meeting. And so I was able to, um, to learn the offense during that period as well. The biggest transition that I always say about that, um, just going to the program was that, as I mentioned, things were very, very structured in, in school and it's a year round thing. All of a sudden, you know, I get, I get picked up in, uh, in May of 2020 by the Lions, and I have to figure out what my lifting schedule is like, what I'm doing for conditioning, what my speed is, because nobody's telling me what to do. Yeah. And we were chatting a little bit before we started. Uh, and that's where I really kind of figured out a little bit more about what I need to be doing for strength conditioning and what yeah. I need to prepare. And uh, I started kind of doing more research, especially specifically in the quarterback space. Yeah. Um, because I do think it is a little bit different um, in terms of how you uh, go about training but that's when I really figured that out is that year and the following year um while I was still in Ontario so the biggest thing is and even in season when I was with the Lions you know they give you a, a program to do if you want but it's again pretty general so you have to kind of figure out what your prehab where you're throwing arm care uh you know plan is and what do you have to do if you have a little bit of a sore arm or you know all the soft mm -hmm. tissue stuff that kind of works for you those tips and tricks that people aren't going to hold your hand yeah. Um, like they do in college a little bit more, especially at the division one level. So um, uh, that was very, very valuable. And I think that that knowledge is going to hopefully bode well at this next step where things are a little bit more, you know, uh, hold your hand, so to speak, where they, they have the facilities and the resources to do so. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, that was the biggest transition was that it's a lot more on you. You have to figure it out, be a pro, which is always what they say. And yeah. um, I think it's a big part of it. Okay. Yeah. From, from university, it's like, they are going to buckle you down and make sure you're doing everything. And mm -hmm. the coaches are checking in with the assistants who are then checking in with the professors to make sure you're going to class. And now it's just Absolutely. like, Hey, make sure you're ready for spring camp next season, buddy. And mm -hmm. here it's like, this is where you should stay within this area. There's also Absolutely. a mutual burrito around the corner. So that's <laughs> all the direction you kind of get to get started there. Yeah, then, there you go. Um, and then I know you got to go pretty soon here. So I've got a couple more questions for you in yeah, no problem. transition. Um, now that you, you know, you had some an amazing season. I, I I'll be honest with you. I didn't go and look at all the numbers and everything, but my stepdad was telling me like during the season and we're, we're sitting here going, man, I hope he goes Seahawks, you know, and I'm sure <laughs> a bunch of weird stuff like that. But, uh, we're sitting here going like, man, 500 plus yards a game thrown. Like this is insane. This is nuts. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're, everyone's kind of anticipating like, where's Nathan Roark going to go? going to Jacksonville. Congratulations mm -hmm. to you. That's amazing. You. And um, what, what are your goals now? You said at the very beginning, you're four years old and you're like, I want to go to the NFL. Well, man, you, mm -hmm. you totally did that. And now what, what's the next goal for you? Well, I'll tell you the, the big goal from that moment when I was four or five was that I want to win a Super Bowl like Brett Favre did in 96. Nice. That, that was, that's what I want to do. And I think as I grow older and you realize that there's kind of a big deal about being a Canadian quarterback, not only in the CFO, but I think in the grand scheme of things yeah. um, that uh, I know it's been done by a guy named Mark Rippon, uh, who was born in Canada, but he's, I would consider him a fake Canadian, um, yeah. someone who would qualify to be a Canadian in the CFL, but uh, very much I assume is considers himself to be American. You know, I'm a guy who was born and raised in Canada. Um, and I'd like to be the first born and raised Canadian quarterback to win a Super Bowl. Um, not only to win it, but to to be the guy to do it. And, and that's the goal. And um, you know, I think that a lot of people obviously look at the Jacksonville situation and say, man, maybe there could have been some better places to go. Um, you know, and and I think that you definitely target those areas and you ask. But the thing that people have to realize is that it's a two-way relationship, right? So um you have to make sure that the interest is reciprocated. And um that wasn't always the case. Um okay. the the biggest thing is just getting for us was getting our my uh my foot in the door and making yeah. sure that we're going to a place where not only do they want you, but you're going to be able to learn. And um the thing about this, the NFL this past year was that uh, I believe there were 64 different 
um, quarterbacks that started a game, um, which is, you know, two, two for every team. Right. So yeah. if you can just be that second guy, um, go into a system where you're going to be able to learn and flourish and maybe not have the pressure to play right away, which might be a good thing in the long run, who knows. Yeah. Um, but if you're able to, to step up and be the guy behind, you know, very solid up and coming quarterback, like Trevor Lawrence, um, but in a great system behind Doug Peterson, where I know that I'm going to be able to learn and, and, um, and grow and, and a quarterback coach, Mike McCoy, who was head coach for the chargers for a couple of years, like just so much wealth of knowledge in that, in that, in that building. And, um, I know if I have a chance to be the the number two guy and if something, you know, God forbid happens to Trevor step Mm -hmm. up and be able to prove, uh, that I belong there. Um, who knows what's going to happen down the line, but, um, I think this is the right step. Again, I haven't taken, taken the, uh, the most direct route uh, to yeah. to the goal to this point, so I don't expect it to be like that moving forward. Um, and I feel like this is a great opportunity to get closer um, to the overall goal of of uh, winning a Super Bowl, like I said earlier. So um, that's that's how I kind of see that decision playing out. That's awesome, and and I, I totally agree with you. I think that it's like an extremely mature decision to make, and you know that no matter what decision you make. That's the thing, the the give and take is that now you're going to the league, you're in the number one place to play football. Mm-hmm. Um, but the catch is that you're always going to be hated by some people and the decisions that are made. And that's just part sure. of how these things work. Um, mm-hmm. People would look at this decision and say, like, why would you go behind a quarterback who's like the franchise quarterback for likely the next 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But it's like you, you're not thinking of winning the Super Bowl next year. You're, right. you're asking yourself and telling yourself like, this is what I'd like to do for the next 10 years as well. So what's my 10 year goal from here. And mm-hmm. if your best interest is with this team, then yeah, let's get foot in the door. Let's get that wealth of knowledge. And to sidebar real quick, like I've been listening to a lot of Alex Hermosi and paying attention to a lot of stuff that he's a, a business entrepreneur and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing that he mentioned is that he was hiring a a kid for a film spot in his business. And he actually accepted this one guy's, you know, resume and offered the kid the job. And he asked and said for another $3,000, not understanding that just taking the job and being able to go into an environment where you can learn and grow. That's where the real value comes from. And I think that doing that, understanding that, no, I'm not number one guy right now, but the opportunity is right there. And even if I'm not for the next year or two, who knows, like being able to work under that mentorship is just going to elevate your game, your knowledge, like to another level that you probably don't even know yet too. So I think that's awesome for you, man. I a hundred percent agree. And I've been, not that it matters too much, but I've been in the, uh, in the comment section, anybody who's been like, what the heck? I'm like, you know what, man, like he's going to the NFL, like give this guy a break. I appreciate it. He's getting it done. So that's awesome, man. Um, Nathan, thank you so much for jumping on. I appreciate your time. I wish you absolutely. the absolute best. And um, people want to follow you. I'm sure they could just go ahead and search your name up. But what's the best way to contact or to just like follow your journey? Yeah, I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Nathan underscore Rourke. Um, yeah. I'm more responsive on Instagram. Twitter has become something I don't use as much. Um, yeah. So Instagram is probably the best way of, uh, of staying in contact with what I do. And I'll try to post once a year at least yeah there you go he's got, he's got his stories he's doing his throwing camps at least going up there all there the you time. go so check it out. there you go yeah that's awesome man okay well thank you so much for your time have a great rest of your day and good luck in your future brother yeah thanks taylor appreciate it okay and